OK, so um, let me see. Yes, what I would like to discuss uh, uh, today, and it will probably take the full, uh, the full uh, uh, lecture, is um, one kind of uh, bond that we discussed last time, and this is the covalent bond. I'm going to discuss this particular type of bond because it's, uh, it gives us um, a feeling of, uh, in general, about uh, other kinds of chemical bonds. And also because you really see uh, how quantum mechanics uh, in action can give you uh, uh, a prediction about uh, why two atoms like to bind to one another, okay? not just from a classical point of view, but from a real quantum mechanical point of view. The, the other reason I like uh, uh, to, to emphasize this uh, type of bond is because the theory that we will be, will be developing um, is going to be uh, easily extendable to uh, an extended infinite system. Okay, so we'll use the same theory to uh, extend our discussion to an infinite system. Okay, but we will start with uh, uh, a system made of two atoms, and we're going to discuss how two atoms interact with one another and uh, uh, form a chemical bond and bind to each other. All right, so the, uh, uh, so we are, uh, the problem is consists in the following. We have a nucleus here, and we have a nucleus uh, here. And let's, for simplicity, consider two hydrogen atoms, HH. All right, so this is just a proton. This is just a proton. So what we're going to discuss is covalent bond in the H2 molecule for practical purposes, OK? Just because it's the simplest uh, uh, covalent bond we can think of, right? It's only one proton, actually two protons, one here and one here, and of course two electrons, because each hydrogen atom brings two electrons to the problem. Now, if the two protons were very far apart, uh, let's say one here and one here, we know the solution of the problem, right? There will be a an electronic cloud here, a 1s state. So the electron will be in the 1s state of the hydrogen atom. The other electron will be here in the 1s state of the hydrogen atom. And they probably will, will not see each other. They would not see each other. They would just live independently as far as, I mean, they are sufficiently far apart. But now the trick is, I mean, we're trying to bring them closer to one another, and we want to study the situation in which the two are close enough that they form a chemical bond. All right? So we have one electron coming from this atom and one electron coming from the other atom. But we know for quantum mechanics that electrons are not distinguishable particles. So we cannot say any longer that an electron is coming from this and an electron is coming from that. What we know in practice is that we have two electrons somewhere localized, somewhere around these two protons. Mm? These two protons give, will give rise to uh, an attraction, right? There will be a, a well that attracts the, uh, the electrons close to the, uh, to the two uh, nuclei. And of course, the potential. So what I'm drawing here is some uh, isosurface lines of the potential. So these two nuclei will generate two Coulomb potentials centered here and here. So these lines here are the isosurfaces of the uh, potential, of the Coulomb potential, due to the nuclei, to the two protons. And the two electrons will be located somewhere here and will respond to the quantum mechanically to the presence of this uh, potential determined by the two protons. So from now on, we will not distinguish whether the electrons were coming from one or for the other. We're just dealing with two electrons. Two electrons living in this uh, complex with this potential of w with a complex shape. There's one thing I'm forgetting when I'm saying this, and this is the interaction between one electron and the other one. Mm -hmm. For the purpose of this discussion, let me assume that I can forget about that. Otherwise, the discussion becomes too complicated. Mm -hmm. So we're going to completely forget electron-electron interactions. interactions, let me put a cross on top of that. Not because they don't exist, 
but because that would make my theory very complicated. And I, as we discussed yesterday, as soon as we move into the many body problem in quantum mechanics, the discussion becomes very complicated. So I'm not saying that, I'm not claiming that it's not there. I'm just claiming that uh, our discussion will give qualitatively the same results if we neglect the electron-electron interaction, and it makes our life much, much simpler if we neglect it. All right, so now let me take a, a cut here and draw the potential, for example, along this uh, cut here. Okay, so I'm going to cut, the, take a line there, uh, and I'm going to express my potential along this line here, and I call it, uh, I can call it R. It's just a line, I mean a, a straight line going through the centers of the, of the protons, and just, just because I want to draw the potential and the potential will be the sum of two Coulomb potentials. So it will look something like that. Actually. Okay. So this is, uh, if, say, this is the origin, this will be the potential seen by each electron. Each electron in this system will see a potential, at least if I look at it along this line, this is the potential that will be seen by the electron. It's a two-well potential. Proton here and the proton here. So we need to solve the quantum mechanics of an electron in this potential. Of course, in three dimensions. Here I'm just showing a cut of the potential. We have to do it in three dimensions, of course. The solution to this problem will give us the charge density, the wave functions, and the solution to the H2 uh, problem. Now, I guess you're familiar with part of this problem, right? You're certainly familiar with the solution of this problem if this was not there. Mm -hmm. Suppose I bring this proton very far apart, right? Then this potential will be just a Coulomb potential here and then a Coulomb potential somewhere else. I mean, very far apart from the... Um, so it will be essentially the sum of two independent Coulomb potentials. And we know the solution to that problem. We know the solution of the problem of a simple Coulomb potential. In fact, it's just a proton, so the solution is just the, the hydrogen atom solution. The problem, of course, is that these two are now close to one another. So how can we use the information that we, have that, that we can extract from the solution of the hydrogen problem in order to solve this more complicated problem. Okay, let me um, write the full potential, which is the sum of these two potentials, as, uh, sorry, as actually a sum of two potentials, right? So let me now here plot this one and this one. By this, of course, I mean... Uh, by these two lines, let me, let me call this V1. V1 is the Coulomb potential due to this proton. And these two lines are V2, the Coulomb potential due to this proton. Right? And therefore, V of R, V1 of R plus V2 of R. Right? I'm, just summing, I'm just expressing the total potential as a sum of the two Coulomb potentials coming from the two atoms, from the two hydrogen atoms. Any question about this? Is it clear? Right? That's exactly, I mean, we have two protons, so we have two Coulomb potentials. So this is the Coulomb potential due to, uh, to atom one, and this is the Coulomb potential due to atom two. I don't want to, s to write it explicitly as uh, E squared over R and so on and so forth because this discussion is actually more general than the hydrogen atom discussion. Here can be any atom. It can be any potential due to the presence of an atom here. So I want to keep the discussion more general. But if you like to think in practical terms, you can think of it as the uh, Coulomb potential due to the proton. If you want to visualize it, if you want to think in practical terms. If we deal with H2, of course, this is, the practic this is in practice the Coulomb potential due to that. But let me be more general. I mean, this is in general the potential felt by an electron sitting on atom 1, and this is the potential felt by an electron sitting on atom 2. If, of course, 
atom one didn't exist and vice versa. This is the potential that the electron would feel if this one was there, but this one was, was removed, of course. The total potential is the sum of the two, obviously. So an electron living in this world will respond to an Hamiltonian, which is given by the sum of the two potentials, right? So we need to solve this problem. This will, the solution to this problem will give us the wave functions and the energies uh, for our problem, for our combined problem. And let me remark once again that this one, this part here, would be the Hamiltonian for atom one, right? Vice versa, if I take this plus this, this would be the Hamiltonian of atom two. So this is, I can call it H1, and this I can call it H2. In other words, if I solve Hamiltonian H1, I will get the solution for atom one. If I solve Hamiltonian H2, I will get the solutions for atom two. What I need to solve is something which is uh, a combination of the two, not the sum of the two, by the way. The potentials sum up, but the Hamiltonians don't sum up because I have the kinetic energy in both sides. Certainly what I can say is that, uh, well, if I'm good at in atomic physics, uh, I know the solutions of H1, right? Suppose that I, I mean, my knowledge of atomic physics is, uh, is infinite. I mean, I know everything about atomic physics. Uh, and so I know that uh, H1 has some solution. For example, the 1S solutions of the hydrogen atom. So if this is the uh, Coulomb potential due to a proton, E square over R, then I know that the solution, I mean, at least the ground state solution of H1 is the 1S state centered here. Okay, so in other words, I know that there will be here a level, which is the 1S level, minus uh, 13 uh, point something below the vacuum, and there will be a wave function here, the 1S wave function. which is a solution of uh, V1. This is what I'm expressing here, right? Similarly, of course, I know that if I sit on H2, hmm, this also is a trivial problem, or at least something that I can assume I, I can solve. This will be, again, a 1S uh, state. Mind you, I'm not putting here explicitly uh, the dependence on the position, but clearly this is the 1A state centered here, and this is a 1A state centered here, right? So it's a different 1A state. It's not the same one. But the energy is the same. Hmm? Uh, shall I call it, uh, let me do this, sorry. Let me put the 1S uh, here and put 1 here. So this is two. Okay. By this, what I mean is that this is the one S state centered at position one, and this is the one S state centered at position two. So this is one uh, S one, and here I have E one S. It's the same orbital, simply centered in a different position. How can I use this information, which I assume I know, right? In the case of the hydrogen atom, it's trivial. In the case of more complex atoms, I assume that I've been able to calculate it or to determine it in some way. How can I now use this information to solve this problem, which is my problem? My problem is to solve the quantum mechanics of an electron in the potential given by the sum of the two potentials, V1 and V2. Now, 
in order to solve this problem, I need to make some approximations. I mean, in principle, I could solve it exactly given some, I mean, uh, if, if I was really trying to, I mean, I could solve it, I mean, as a, as a second order differential equation, numerically or not analytically, certainly, but numerically. But let me suggest uh, an approximation that will allow us to understand a number of things about uh, this Hamiltonian. So let me suggest that when I look for the solutions of uh, Hamiltonian age, that is wave functions phi such that this is an eigenstate of H, H being the full Hamiltonian, the one uh, given by V1 and V2, I look for solutions where phi is a linear combination of these two orbitals, these two wave functions. plus A2 phi 2, 1s. Hmm? Of course, I'm restricting myself, uh, my, I mean, the set of possible solutions considerably. Hmm? But let me assume that I can do it, hmm? that I can express my solution as a linear combination of the solutions to the two different problems. It's certainly not going to be an exact solution. It's an approximation. So I'm here I'm introducing an approximation. Because but, but, but we can tell that it's, this approximation is certainly good in the limit where the two protons are very far apart, right? Because if they are very far apart, we know that the solution is either this or this. So trivially, by having a1 equals to 1 and a2 equals to 0, or vice versa, I can recover the solution in the limit where this is very distant, where the two protons are very distant. So in some sense, what I'm doing is I'm saying, well, suppose I start from a solution I know, that is, uh, that the two wave functions are independent, and let me bring the two protons closer and closer and closer. The, the true solution will become a mixture of the original solutions of the two independent problems. Mm -hmm. So qualitatively, this is the argument that I'm using to uh, justify my choice of uh, the wave function expressed in this, uh, in this form. Again, it's not an exact uh, statement, but it is an approximation. So let's see the consequences of uh, expressing the wave function in this way. And let's see if we, have a, if we can find a way to determine A1 and A2, right? Our unknown, uh, unknowns at this point, uh, if we want to solve this problem, are A1 and A2. Of course, the other unknown is the energy. Phi 1, 1s, phi 2, 1s are given. They are the solution of the atomic problem, which I am I'm assuming I, I've already solved. Okay? And similarly, I assume that I already know this energy, which in the case of the hydrogen atom is the 1s energy of the hydrogen atom. Okay, so let me try to solve this problem by explicitly using this expression for phi. So H is written there. Plus V1 plus V2. Phi. Let me drop uh, the 1s index to, for simplicity, okay? So I'm going to drop the 1s uh, just for clarity. So this is the equation I would need to solve for A1, A2, and E, my three unknowns. All the rest is fixed and is given. Let me now notice something interesting here on the left-hand side. Again, this is H1. And I know that phi1 is an eigenstate of H1. So when I apply this expression to the first term, hmm, let me do H1 plus V2 times phi1. Okay, so let me write this as A1 H1 phi1 plus 
a1 v2 phi1. Right? What I'm doing is I'm applying the left-hand side of the product to the first term on the right-hand side. But in doing that, I'm writing the Hamiltonian as h1 plus v2. Right? That's my definition. Let me now apply, again, the left-hand side to the second part of the product, phi 2. If I do that, however, I decompose this in a different way. I'm going to now write it as uh, h2 plus v1. It's equally good, right? v1. Okay? It's clear why I did it. I did it because uh, h2 phi 2, I know the solution already. Similarly, h1 a, a, a phi 1, it's the solution of my atomic problem. Right? So I've extracted out of my h the part for which I know the solution of. And I left v2 and v1 here as an extra term. H1 phi 1 is the atomic energy for state uh, phi 1. So this is uh, um, A1 E 1s. Uh, let me actually, instead of calling it 1s, uh, let me call it uh, uh, E naught. I mean, this is the atomic energy, okay? I'm using 1s because I was assuming that this was an hydrogen atom, but I, I don't want to restrict my discussion to the hydrogen atom. If you prefer, you can assume that E0 is the hydrogen atom energy if this, is a, if this is a proton and you have only one electron. But I want to be more general. The point is that this is the atomic energy. It's the eigenvalue of my atomic problem for this atomic wave function. And someone has given it to me. I don't... I assume that that problem has been already solved, the atomic problem. So this is, if you wish, E1s. If you wish to be more general, it's the atomic energy of state, uh, of the atomic state phi1 times phi1 plus A1 V2 phi1 plus A2, same with H2 phi2. H2 phi 2 is the solution, it's the atomic problem. So this will be same energy, whatever that is, 1s, 2s, whatever, same energy times phi 2. This is, of course, only the left hand side. There's always the right hand side which I can continue writing. Okay. So, again, this is an equation of which I need to find uh, A1, A2, and E, my three unknowns. All the rest is given. However, it is an equation between functions. It's not an equation between numbers. In fact, if I want to determine three numbers, I would need three equations between numbers, right, at least. Here I have a single equation, but it is an equation between functions. So in fact, I have somehow an inf infinitely many equations between numbers that I can derive from an equation between functions, right? If I have an equation between functions, for example, I can say that that all th these two functions, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, have to, have to be equal at all in all the points, right? So this is, in principle, gives me an infinitely many set, uh, large set of uh, equations between numbers. And here I have only three numbers. So in some sense, I'm overcomplete in, uh, in my, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, in, in the number of constraints that I'm putting to this, uh, to this equation. But let me try, instead of uh, looking at, say, the equality at a given point, which will give me an equation between numbers, uh, let me do something else. Let me try and extract out of this equation between functions uh, two equations between numbers. And the way I do it is the following. 
I take left hand side and right hand side considered as functions and I project them onto phi 1 first time and phi 2 second time. What do I mean by projection of a function onto another function? Are you familiar with this concept or not uh, of a projection? A projection in mathematical terms essentially means that, uh, um, I think I can write here, if I have a function there on the light, left hand side, suppose I have a function here, f, and I want to project it onto another function, say phi 1 for example, what I mean is the integral over the whole space of f times phi 1, right? That's the projection. In fact, you may think of this in, in bracket notation. I'm sure you've seen bracket notation, right? So what I mean by that, by projection, is simply, I simply don't want to, I, I don't like to write it in terms of brackets. Otherwise, I would express the, if you liked, I mean, I could express this as a, as a bra, and I would projection onto a phi 1 means that I'm taking this and I'm projecting it onto a phi 1 or phi 2. If you don't like uh, brackets, the uh, projection means that I'm essentially taking a function and I'm taking the integral times uh, um, the function that I want to project uh, uh, the other function onto. Okay, so that transforms a function into a number, right? Because this is an integral, so this is a number. So either you see it as a bracket uh, a projection or you see it just as an integral times a function, which I can choose. In fact, my previous argument that I could have chosen to equate these two functions at a given point in space, which was again another way to extract out of a, an equation between functions and equation between numbers, uh, would correspond to project uh, my function onto the delta function. If f1, sorry, if phi1 is the delta function at a given point, right, this integral gives me the value of the function at that point. Mm? So it's the same essentially. I'm simply using a different, when I say that I equate two functions at a given point, I'm, it's equivalent to saying that I'm projecting that function onto the delta function centered at that point. Here I'm, I don't like delta functions, so I'm going to project it, for example, onto phi 1 and onto phi 2, separately of course. So I'm going to take this equation here, left hand side and right hand side, and I'm going to project it onto phi 1 first. Um, how familiar are you with bracket notation? Are you all familiar with that? Can I work with bracket? Because that would simplify my notation if I do that. Okay, great. So then let me use bracket notation because it's, uh, otherwise I would have to write everything in terms of integrals, which is okay, but it's a bit uh, complicated. So this is my bra part of the uh, function. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to project it onto phi 1, both sides. And I'm going to write the result here in the next line. So, first term, phi 1, phi 1. A1, E0, phi 1, phi 1. But what is phi 1, phi 1? 1, right? Because it's the, phi 1 is the solution of, a, of an Hamiltonian. So this must be normalized. So this is 1. Plus, A1, in fact, here I have to be careful. Um, the wave function is actually to the left here. When I write it in bracket notation, this has to be phi 1, V2, and even here, sorry. When I, if I write it in bracket notation, it has to be phi 2 v1, like this, okay? Because I have to project it on the left side when I write the Hamiltonian here. So this is phi 1 v2 phi 1 plus e2 a2 e0 phi 2 
by 1 plus a2 phi 2 b1 phi 1. And that's the left hand side. What about the right hand side? E a1 phi 1 phi 1 plus E A2 phi 1, sorry, phi 2 phi 1. This is again 1. What can I say about the other terms? For example, this one. Phi 2, phi 1. Phi 2, phi 1. Why? Why? Why is it orthogonal? Phi 1 and phi 2, are they eigenfunctions of H? Right, so. So phi 1 and phi 2 are eigenfunctions phi 1 of H1 and phi 2 of H2. Is there any reason why they should be uh, orthogonal? No, no. no. There are two eigenfunctions of two different Hamiltonians. No reason why they should be orthogonal. Of course, H1 is, orto I mean, is orto uh, this is orthonormal, so this is one. But phi 1, phi 2, they're not, uh, I mean, they're eigenfunctions of two different, I mean, actually, they have, they have the same shape, in fact. Uh, they don't have nodes in between. How can you make them orthogonal? No. However, in the spirit of our original approximation, which where we stated that uh, we wrote our wave function as a linear combination of two orbitals phi 1 and phi 2, because what we had in mind was a system in which uh, we were just perturbing the uh, solution given by the two independent uh, systems. Hmm? we can assume that these two wave functions are sufficiently far from one another. Hmm? If they get too close, this original approximation is going to fail, to break down, because we've realized that this is going to work in the limit where the two wave functions are very far apart, but when they get very close, their overlap between these two wave functions is going to be substantial, and therefore, there's no guarantee that the wave function can be still expressed as a linear combination of the original wave functions, which are wave functions that are valid as long as the two Coulomb potentials are very far apart. In some sense, perturbation theory, which was our initial argument uh, to justify that justify this choice, if the two wave functions get too close, is going to break down. All right. So. Although these are two wave functions of, for two different Hamiltonians, uh, we can. Yes. Yes, in the real in the R3. Right, that's exactly my argument. If these are sufficiently far apart, okay, the overlap between phi 1 and phi 2 is going to be small. Certainly not zero, it's going to be small, exponentially small, because these are exponential functions. So if I continue to, uh, I mean, keep this approximation, I need to assume that these two wave functions are far, are not too close, because otherwise there's no way I can write phi as a linear combination of the two independent solutions and then just using perturbation theory. The argument is mathematically a bit more complex than that, but allow me to, uh, for simplicity, to say that, okay, let me approximate this to zero. Hmm? So, I'm going now to, uh, so I'm going now to make sure that we understand where are the approximations here. Yes, uh, come in a second. So this is one, and I'm highlighting with, with red the approximations. This is an approximation. And the second approximation is that uh, phi 1, phi 2 is equal to 0, okay, which is an approximation. Yes? Okay, if we see on phi 1 and phi 2, they, they go like U.S. 
two minus infinity the norm of the length of socket from zero to one. Yes, sir. Uh, so whether there are load limits or whether there are parts. Yes. If we, okay, if we sum up on the whole thing, then with the wave function, that is uh, one-ish uh, relativity are those things. So the, the inner product on the projection will be zero, right? The projection, the projection will be proportional to the overlap between the two wave functions, right? So if these two wave functions were to, to sit on the same place, eh, this would be one, right? If, if I bring this proton here, phi one and phi two will be exactly overlapping, and so this will be exactly one. They have, they're actually the same wave function. So this, this product here, this overlap, is proportional to the overlap between these two wave functions. And if these are sufficiently far apart, far apart compared to the decay length of the exponential wave function, then I can claim that this is at least, I mean, small for our purposes. Okay? But the important thing to keep in mind that this, they are they are, it's zero not because they're orthogonal, but because of physical reasons. Yes? Yes, sir. So, what do you mean by physical Okay, that's a very good question. We, we, our goal is to uh, see the formation of a bond. How can we continue assuming that the two wave functions are very far apart? Because the theory of uh, formation of chemical bond in the limit where these two wave functions have a large overlap is much more complicated than that. Okay? So, I need to approach the problem with some reasonable approximations that allow me to uh, develop some mathematics out of it. Mm -hmm. The truth is actually probably closer to my approximation than to your statement. In other words, the two wave, even if you take the hydrogen atom, the overlap between the two um, 1s orbitals uh, in, the, in the real system, when you bring them together, mm -hmm. is not that big. It's not that big. Mm -hmm. Consider that in the hydrogen atom, the distance between... Uh, to, uh, in the real system, this distance for, for the H2, uh, for the H2 um, molecule, for example, is uh, about uh, 1.4 uh, Bohr radii. Okay? And the decay length of this uh, mm, is Bohr radius. Uh, okay? So, well. So, so so by the time you get to this point, uh, this wave function has become 1 over E, and this has become 1 over E here. So the overlap is there, but it's not really heavy. It's not substantial. Okay? It's not going to change quantitatively. It's, uh, sorry, it's not going to change qualitatively the result. It's going to change quantitatively the result, but not qualitatively. Okay? But you're right. I mean, of course, if you want to see the formation of the bond, we need to have these two wave functions overlap. So how can we approximate now that the overlap is zero? We are treating the problem from a perturbative point of view. So we have to uh, approach and assume that the two remain at some distance. Uh, but we will see that there are consequences that uh, are qualitatively consistent with the formation of a chemical bond anyway, if you proceed with this. OK, so we're going to uh, remove this. We're going to remove also this one as a consequence. And well, I see, I mean, the other thing we can notice is this. This is what? Uh, wait a sec. This is uh, phi one v two. No, that's fine. That's fine. Sorry. A one. Oh, this one is a one, right? No, a two. This one is a one. No, a two, a two. This one. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, let me now here repeat the same exercise. So this was projected on uh, phi 1. And now let me do the same thing by projecting onto phi 2. OK, the same equation, but now projected onto phi 2. Well, now we can do it quickly, right? The first term, if I project it on phi 2, is within our approximations, of course, uh, 0. Right? So this is not there. I have to start with the second one. Phi 1, sorry. A1, 
phi 1 b2 phi 2. That's this. Here, phi 2 phi 2 is 1. So this is just a2 e0. This one, well, remains more or less what we phi 2. And then we have the right hand side. This one disappears, and this is just uh, E A2, because phi 2, phi 2 is 1. Right now, this one here, otherwise I'm I is equal to A1 phi 1 plus A2 phi 2. Because I'd like to, uh, I want to work on the left side of the blackboard here. All right, so I have two equations, and these two equations now are equations between numbers finally. It's only two, by the way, it's not three. And I have three unknowns. However, let me rewrite, just mathematics now, this set of, uh, this pair of uh, equations. These are actually linear equations in my unknowns, right? A1, A2, and E appear both here and here in a linear fashion. Mm -hmm. So let me write them in matrix form. I'll first write it as a matrix, and then you'll recognize that I'm writing exactly the same thing. So let me write it like this. Um, here. Sorry. Where's the other A1 here? Plus phi 1, V2, phi 1. Then here I have phi 2. B1, phi 2, phi 1. Mm, sorry. Here, phi 1. Oops. V2, phi 2. And here I have E0 plus phi 2, V1, phi 2. Yes? This one? Okay. This was the projection of the right hand side onto phi 2. Right? Yeah, I mean. The bottom line is the projection on phi 1. The top line here, you see, phi 1 here and phi 2 here. I'm projecting this equation between functions twice, first on phi 1, second time on phi 2. So these are my two equations, up below and above the uh, original equation, OK? So now, actually, this one is projected on phi 2, of course. So then phi 2, if I project this one on phi 2, this is 1, and this is 0, right, the 2. So this becomes EA2. Hmm? So I have a central equation between functions. Below this central equation, I'm projecting on F on phi 1. Above this equation, I'm projecting on phi 2. Hmm? And now I'm considering the two equations between numbers uh, below and above the original one. And what I've done is I've rewritten these two equations in matrix form. You just have to recognize that I've done a good job. Actually, can you check that I've done a good job? Uh, right, so this would be the first one, right? So it's uh, A1 times E0 plus phi 1, V2, phi 1. Where is A1? A1 is here, E0, 
B1, phi1, B2, A phi1, okay. Then I have plus A2 times phi2, B1, phi2, uh, phi1, here you go, phi2, B1, phi1, equals to E, A1, E, A1, okay? You can check that the first one is also correct. All right, I've simply rewritten these two linear equations in, in matrix form. And I guess you now recognize this equation, or at least the form of this equation. This is an eigenvalue problem for E1. A1 and A2 are my unknowns, in addition to E, of course. Obviously, A1 and A2 are obey a special relationship. The sum of their squares must be 1. Why is that so? Well, I just obtain it from here. I want to impose that phi phi is normalized, right? But when I do phi phi, phi phi is equal to a1 squared plus a2 squared because all the cross products give me zero in this approximation. The approximation of phi1 uh, projected on phi2 is zero, all right? So a1 squared plus a2 squared must be one if I use this approximation. Well, I'm, I'm here I'm not using complex numbers, I'm using real numbers. I'm, I'm not, I mean, A1 for me is a, is a real number. It's a one-dimensional, I mean, it's a, I don't need to invoke uh, complex numbers here. I can work with real numbers. All right, so I have a standard two by two quantum mechanics, uh, I mean, diagonalization of a, of a matrix, right? And A1 and A2 are going to be my, Eigenstate, or at least the coefficients that express my wave functions uh, in, in that basis, and E is going to be my energy. Let me simplify the notation a bit further. What can I say about these two terms, this one and this one? Let's think about it uh, seriously, hmm? carefully. Phi 1 is this one here, okay, the, the orange one. V2 is the Coulomb potential on the other side. Phi1 is again my wave function on the initial side. Okay, let's look at this one now. Phi2 appears twice and it's here and V1 is the potential on the other side. Hmm? What can I say about these two terms? Hmm? The functions here are just inverted, right? But if the problem is symmetric, if this atom is the same as this, the integral, that is the uh, expectation value, must be the same. Mm -hmm. And because it appears uh, in this uh, term here with E naught, let me call it delta E naught. I'm just giving it a name, right? I'm just call it in order to, uh, I mean, simplify a bit the notation. So by delta E naught, I mean this object. The product between the square of the wave function at the given site times the Coulomb potential at another site. And I call it delta E naught. What about this one and this one? Here it's a bit more complicated, but it's a wave function on two times wave function on one, Coulomb potential on one. Here, wave function on one, Coulomb potential on two, wave function on two. They're just reverted, okay? When I take the integral, the two give me the same number. If, of course, the two atoms are the same. All right? This term here, I call it T. In solid state physics, this is typically uh, takes a name of hopping parameter. It's called hopping because uh, you're jumping from one wave function to the other one. And there are some physical consequences that uh, derive from this particular term. Mm -hmm. So just keep in mind that this is, in the jargon of solid state physics, this term is called the hopping term. Which, because it's hopping from one side to the other one with the help of a Coulomb potential. Similarly, Delta E naught is typically called the on-site term. Mm -hmm. 
term because it's something that depends on the wave function at the given site. So we have introduced two new uh, entities, T, the hopping term, and the on-site energy. So we can now rewrite my, uh, just, I'm just going to rewrite it for simplicity with a new notation. So it's going to be E naught plus delta E naught, T, T, E naught plus delta E naught, A1, A2, okay? So now it's, it looks even simpler. This 2 by 2 matrix is of the form A, A, B, B. Very simple. Hermitian, same numbers in the diagonal. What are the eigenvalues of this uh, matrix, two by two matrix? Hmm. Hmm. If I give you a matrix of this form, can you tell me, I mean, right on the spot, what are the eigenvalues of this matrix? Or do you need to calculate them? Any good physicist uh, would tell you immediately what uh, the eigenvalues of this. I mean, you're still at the learning stage, but uh, be ready to uh, learn it by heart, what the eigenvalues of this are. So let's calculate them, okay? We'll do it now, and that's the last time I'm going to do it at the blackboard. Next time, I assume you'll know it. Okay, secular equation, A minus lambda, right? Determinant of secular equation, A minus lambda, Square minus b squared equals to zero. A minus lambda equals to plus or minus b. Lambda equals to a plus or minus b. Okay? Minus plus, whatever. Okay, so this matrix a, a, b, b has these two eigenvalues. Actually, I need to be careful uh, and put the uh, absolute value which doesn't change if this is a real number, because if, I, if the sign of b is negative, I can just change the two signs. It's irrelevant. But if this is a complex number, of course, I have to be careful. Well, if this is a complex number here, it would have b star, of course, not b. So I'm assuming that I'm working with. Uh, so let, let me assume that I'm working with real numbers to keep uh, this. Uh, nah, whatever. Let's do it like that. OK? So this is probably, one, this is probably the most common uh, two by two uh, problem, actually the most common quantum mechanical problem you can think of, a two level system, a two state model, and the eigenvalues are given, if these two numbers are degenerate, that is if the, the two energies are the same, they're given by A plus or minus the off diagonal term, absolute value. Okay? Keep it there somewhere in your brain because this will be very recurrent in physics uh, if you want. Okay. Well, uh, let's be a bit more careful than that. Uh, let me be, uh, well, okay, let me, um, um, let me do this. Uh, wait a sec. Um, because I want to make sure we, we get the signs properly. So, 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 um, hmm. so let me take, uh, I want to get the, the signs properly because I also want to get the eigen, the eigen um, states. Hmm. So let me take the solution A plus B, lambda plus is equals to A plus B, okay? Right, so the A, A1, 
plus b a2 equals to a plus b a1, right? And of course, uh, b a1 plus a a2 is equal to a plus b a2. I'm just writing now the uh, two linear equations, uh, assuming that I'm looking for the eigenstates with eigenvalue a plus b. I know there are two solutions, so let me now find the values of a1 and a2 that satisfy the, um, that correspond to the eigenvalue uh, a plus b. Okay, so here I have uh, um, this one disappears, right? So I have that uh, a1 has to be equal to a2. And obviously the same here, right? This, is, this disappears, and so a1 has to be equal to a2. So that's the same solution. Which means if I consider that the, the square, the squares of the, uh, the sum of the squares is, is 1, a1 equals to a2 means that uh, they have to be 1 over square root 2 each one. But I mean, this is not really relevant for us. The important thing for us is that when I have the plus here, a1 must be equal to a2. That is, they, both, they are both going to be equal to 1 over square root 2 because of the normalization constraint. Vice versa, and let me now use the orange color. If I'm looking for the minus solution with the minus sign, what changes here is the minus sign here and the minus sign here. And what you see is that uh, now a1 must be equal to minus a2. Both equations are satisfied only if uh, um, a1 is equal to minus a2. Okay? So the one with the minus sign corresponds to a1 equals to minus a2, a2. Good. That's important because now I'm going to use this... Uh, um, findings uh, to determine here the, uh, the wave functions. In fact, I can say that the two solutions, there are two solutions, one which I call E plus, which is uh, given by E naught plus delta E naught plus T. Hmm? And the corresponding energy, in the corresponding wave function is uh, the one with the plus. So it's a uh, one over square root two phi one plus phi two. A one is equal to A two. Are you okay? You're lost. No, I'm okay. No, I'm okay. Huh? I'm okay. You're okay. Okay. So solution with plus. A plus is A plus B, A plus B. In that case, A1 is equal to A2, and are equal to 1 over square root 2. If A1 is equal to A2 and is equal to 1 over square root 2, the wave function will be 1 over square root 2 phi 1 plus phi 2. Here you go. Second solution, E minus, E naught plus delta E naught minus T. Eigenfunction, phi minus phi 1 minus phi 2. Okay? Yes. N by N matrices? Okay. Oh, you want you want a three by three, for example? Okay, maybe, maybe one and you want a three by three of the form what? Uh, a A and B B is everywhere? Mm -hmm. mm, no, it's complicated. No, no. I'm just talking about uh, two by two here. 
Mm. I'm not assuming, although, I mean, it, you might remember what uh, eigenvalues for a 3 by 3 matrix of this form could look like. I don't, in fact. I would have to uh, think about it. 2 by 2 is uh, straightforward. I mean, I'm, I would like you to remember it by heart, that the uh, 2 by 2 Hamiltonian of this form, energy in the diagonal, of diagonal term, mm, the eigenvalues are the diagonal term plus or minus the off-diagonal term. Okay? That's something that is uh, very recurrent in physics. Very, very. Both in particle physics, in solid state physics, in any other field, atomic physics, any field of physics. So this is what we are, what we are doing here. So out of this two by two problem, we have extracted two eigenvalues, E plus and E minus, given by A plus B, A minus B, and the corresponding uh, eigenfunctions. Good. Oof. So, let me now, uh, for a moment, go back to my extreme case where the uh, two protons were very far apart. Mm? Let's see if I can recover the solution in the extreme case. If I've done everything properly, I should be able to recover the solution in the extreme case. Well, in the extreme case, if these two wave functions, these two protons are very far apart, I know that the solution is uh, the 1s orbital here and the 1s orbital there. And in particular, I know that their energy is the 1s energy, the atomic energy, E0. So what happens in the limit of, uh, uh, in the limit where these two atoms are very far apart uh, in my equation? Which term is going to be affected by the fact that I'm separating the atoms one from the other one? Well, E0 is certainly not going to be affected. E0 is an atomic property. So it's not going to change if I take the two atoms far apart. What about this term here? This is uh, the overlap between the wave function at site 1 and the Coulomb potential at site 2. If I bring the two atoms far apart, this term will vanish. Same with this term, right? Here is the wave function at site 1 and wave function at site 2. The overlap will decay to 0 if the two atoms are very far apart. So both delta E0 and T will go to 0 if my two atoms go very far apart from one another. Hmm? So let me actually do this uh, here. If d, say d, the distance between the atoms, goes to infinity, then delta, d, delta E0 goes to 0, and also t goes to 0. So my two eigenvalues, E plus and E minus, become E0. That's exactly what I expected. E plus and E minus both become equal to E0. I know that the energy must tend to the atomic energy if the two atoms are very far apart. There is a problem, however. I was expecting that in that limit, these two wave functions the two solutions would be this wave function and this wave function. What do I get here? Linear combination of phi 1 plus phi 2, linear combination of phi 1 minus phi 2, regardless of the value of delta E0 and T. Whatever is delta E0 and T, if this becomes 0, it's still the same. It doesn't change. Why? So what is, the, uh, what is the problem? I got the right energies. I got what I wanted. The energies are OK. And what about the wave functions? Huh? Why do I get two wave functions which are not the wave function on atom 1 and the wave function on atom 2? Why do I still get the linear combination if the two atoms don't even know about each other? Hmm. 
Yes. Right. And then what can I do if the if e plus and e minus are the same? Then perfect. Okay. So if the two eigenstates are degenerate, I can build any linear combination I want out of the eigen out of the eigenfunctions, right? So the fact that I get plus and minus here is just reminiscent of what I was doing before. But now that I know that the two energies are the same and they are in the limit of delta in naught and t go to zero, I can just rearrange the eigen, eigenfunctions, I mean, building any linear combination I want. So I can take the sum and the difference, and I will get phi 1 and phi 2. Okay? That's the point. Mm? So you, need, you don't need to be surprised by the fact that these two wave functions are different with respect to what I expected. They are different just because it's a different linear combination of functions out of a two-fold degenerate manifold. I have two degenerate states. I can build any linear combination I want out of uh, 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 eigenfunctions which are degenerate. And in particular, this is one of the many possible, the infinitely many possible linear combinations that I can build out of two degenerate, uh, out of uh, two uh, degenerate uh, solutions. Okay, so nothing is wrong. Everything is is right. I'm, it's perfectly legitimate, perfectly consistent. If delta in naught and t go to zero. I recover my atomic, uh, my atomic uh, scenario, my atomic limit, within, of course, some additional considerations that I have to make about uh, the wave functions. Good. So let me now imagine the process of taking these two atoms very far apart and bringing them closer and closer and closer. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, I will have the two wave functions, the two solutions, with some rearrangement, whatever, and these two energies. Let me just restrict my consideration now to energies for the time being. What's going to happen to the energies? Well, if I start bringing these two atoms close by, there are two consequences. First, there is a shift of the average position of these two energy levels uh, uh, given by delta in naught. In addition, there is a splitting between the two states, which is given by t. So delta in naught and t give rise to two completely different effects in terms of energy. One of them is just a rigid shift of both levels. Both levels used to be degenerate in the limit where the two atoms were infinitely distant. Now we bring them then closer to one another. This is a rigid shift, and this is a splitting. Hmm? Let me discuss briefly uh, the sign of these terms. What can I say about the sign of delta in naught and t? Well, not too much, in fact. It depends on what is the wave function here. Delta A naught, for example, is the product of phi 1, phi 1, and V2. <clears throat> so it really depends what phi 1 and V2 are. But, well, product phi 1, phi 1 is certainly a positive function. V2, what can I say about V2? Whether it's Coulomb, whatever it is, it is an attractive potential, right? So this object is certainly negative. So what I can say, actually, is that uh, delta, that's my white chalk. I can certainly say that uh, delta E naught is negative, right? What about T? Hmm, here things get a bit more complicated because I know that V2 is negative. It's an attractive potential, so it must be negative. About phi 1 and phi 2, well, if they are 1s, states. Hmm? They are both positive, right? The 1s state is positive all over the space. So if they are 1s states, I can certainly say that this is negative. If <coughs> 1s states. I cannot, I mean, say that this is a general statement, however. Think of, say, phi 2 being a, a p-wave function with a node. A p-wave function takes also negative values. So if the negative side of the wave function happens to be where overlapping with phi 1, which is perhaps a positive function, the whole thing will become positive. Okay? So I cannot really say too much about the sign of t in general. For 1s states, I can certainly say that t is negative. So for the hydrogen atom, I can certainly say that this is negative because 1s, 1s is positive. They're positive wave functions. Okay? So... Delta in naught is negative. T is, uh, well, typically negative, but not necessarily. 
I bring the two atoms close to one another. So there will be, sorry. There will be a shift, a rigid shift of the uh, average value of uh, these levels by an amount given by delta E naught, which is negative. In addition to that, there will be a splitting, right? I'm now showing the splitting for a negative t. Hmm? If t is negative, plus t will bring me down, minus t will bring me up. So the two solutions will be E0, rigid shift for both, and then plus or minus t in the opposite direction. Now, in drawing this, I'm actually assuming that uh, the absolute value of t is larger than the absolute value of delta E0, which is not necessarily the case. Mm. I'm just assuming here that the, the absolute value of t is larger than the absolute value of delta E0, but this is not uh, of necessarily the case. So I will have two states, this one and this one. Uh, plus t was E plus. So this is E plus. Minus t is uh, E minus, OK? Oh, I sorry. I removed the wave functions. But I'm sure you remember that E plus was phi, pl phi 1 plus phi 2, and E minus was phi 1 minus uh, phi 2, right? So if I now have to draw the wave functions on top of these energy levels, I'm going to get something like this, this plus this, the E plus state will have the two-wave function summed with the same sign, and E minus will be this wave function, and here minus the wave function, okay? So phi 1 minus phi 2. This will be phi plus, and this will be phi minus. OK. It's not over yet, because I have to now fill those states. How many electrons did I have at the beginning? Two electrons, right? So where am I going to place those two electrons? Uh, First, uh, since the energy, I have to follow the hierarchy of energies, right? I have to place them in the lowest possible energy states. I have two electrons. Where do I place them? Spin up and spin down. I place them both in E+. plus. So in this picture, I'm going to place my two electrons both in this state, and no electron in E minus. OK? This is a very important statement. Hmm? And in fact, this is true as long as I work with H2. Suppose I was working with, uh, say, H2 minus the ion, the negatively charged ion. H2 minus would have three electrons. It would still, the potential would still be given by the two protons. So the whole exercise would be exactly the same. The only exception would be that now I would have to place one electron in E minus. Okay? Similarly, if I want to study H2 plus, this, the exercise would have been exactly the same, of course, if electron electron interactions are negligible. Hmm? If they're negligible, the exercise would be exactly the same, and I would have to fill this state with one electron only, with H2+, plus, okay? because I only want, have one electron available. 
But since I mean I'm talking about H2, let me assume that I'm filling this state with two electrons. Good. Yes? Sorry, why not? I have two electrons and I have two states out of my eigenvalue problems. I need to place the electrons in the lowest available state, right? So I have to place them here, both. Why E plus is the lowest? Because, well, this is true regardless of delta H. It's because of plus T and minus T. Right? These are the two energies. These are the two eigenenergies. With respect to E naught, which was the original state, I shift both of them by delta E naught, and I've done it through this uh, middle green line. And then I have to, away from E naught plus delta E naught, go up or down by T. Right? Notice that t is negative, so plus t goes down. Okay. So Good. Yes? You give us some what? Sorry? Uh, some. Uh, you'll see. I mean, we'll come back to this. Uh, I mean several times in the future. So we, you'll learn more about this delta naught and T in the future. Let me just uh, solve this problem of the H2 molecule first, and then we'll, we'll look at more extensively at that. OK, first, consequences, first consequence of this exercise. What can I say about the overall energy of my system? Hmm? What was the original energy of the system when the two atoms were at infinitely far from one another? It was the two electrons in the 1s state, or E0. Okay? So the original energy, if I'm talking about the total energy of my system, hmm, at the beginning it was 2E0, right? If D is infinity, right? Twice. The atomic energy, it's a negative number, of course. But if now we bring the two atoms close to one another, the electrons are no longer here. They're actually here. Hmm? So it's actually twice E0 plus delta E0 plus T. And both of them are negative. So this energy here, sorry, the new one, is going to be below the original one. You have an, an energy gain of twice delta E naught plus T. Right? Let's put it in absolute value, right? If I'm talking about energy gain. It's like if, I, if I mean gain, I mean positive numbers, right? So I put an absolute value. So I've gained energy by doing that. I've gained energy by rewriting the wave functions, building these linear combinations of wave functions, and taking advantage of uh, these two terms. That is, taking advantage of the fact that uh, whenever this wave function sees the other Coulomb potential, sorry, here and here, it, there is a gain of energy in doing that. Takes advantage of the presence of the other nucleus. Hmm? The physics is obvious, right? There is an electron on this side which sees the other nucleus and takes advantage of the other nucleus by building this linear combination. And similarly for the other one, takes advantage of the other nucleus by building this linear combination. Of course, you might actually argue that uh, we are neglecting electron-electron interactions. So it is true that the electron takes advantage of the positive nucleus here, but in principle, you should also feel the repulsion of the other electron, which is on the other side. Mm -hmm. So our argument is not complete. Mm -hmm. One can, of course, show that the dominant effect is the nuclear one. It's the gain due to the nuclear interaction. And the electron-electron uh, interaction is a correction to that. So I just want you to keep in mind that uh, the gain is, uh, I mean, there is also a loss mechanism in doing that, which we're not considering because we are neglecting electron-electron interactions. But the argument is qualitatively the same, um, even if you include electron-electron correlations. So 
The first conclusion is that there is an energy gain, and the energy gain is proportional to the overlap of the wave function, to how much the wave function sees the other nucleus. By the way, you might actually argue that there is an inconsistency here in our uh, discussion. And in fact, uh, if I really want to be careful, I need to be a bit more precise about it. You remember we made this approximation. So we assume that the overlap of the wave function on 1 and 2 was 0. Here, we are retaining terms which have to do with the overlap of phi 1 and phi 2 here, or with phi 1 and the Coulomb potential on the other side. Okay? So we're not totally consistent when we do this. Uh, we are neglecting this and we are keeping this. Again, I'd like you to keep this in mind because uh, all what we are doing goes through approximations which are just meant to make our calculations easy to, uh, to do in a, in a, in a lecture. Mm. If I had to keep all these effects into account, that would take way longer than a lecture. But it is still true, trust me, that if you keep all these things properly into account, you will get uh, something qualitatively similar to this one. But please keep in mind that I'm, there are a few inconsistencies in this. Uh, the other one was the one that you mentioned, namely, how can I build a, a, a charge in the middle if I'm assuming that this is zero, there's no overlap. Okay. Okay, first consequence, uh, energy gain, net energy gain, uh, if I form a bond. What do I mean by a bond? I mean, here I'm still playing with the original wave functions, right? So what do I mean that there is a formation of bond, that there is an accumulation of charge in the middle? Hmm? After all, I'm still using the old wave function, so how can I get an accumulation of charge in the middle? That's not exactly true. Let's place ourselves at this point, exactly in the middle between the two, uh, two atoms. Mm? And think about what the charge density was before and after we have introduced this uh, linear combination. Mm? That is, suppose we look at the charge density at this point, if we just take the sum of the charge density coming from this atom and from this atom, or if we do it by constructing the charge density of the phi plus orbital. Hmm? So, if I assume that the two atoms don't see each other, the density here would be the density of, would be phi 1 squared plus phi 2 squared, right? The density of electron 1 coming from atom 1, the density of electron 2 coming from atom 2 at this point. By symmetry, they are the same, right? Because we are at the same distance. And this is a very small number, by the way, because this is an exponential decay. So this will be the density that I would measure if atom 1 didn't know about atom 2 and vice versa. Let me now calculate the density which I obtain by assuming that this is the correct solution. Hmm? Phi plus is what? I have to take phi plus squared and I have to multiply times two because I have two electrons in that state. Here I have one electron here and one electron here. Now both electrons are in phi plus. And phi plus is one over square root two, phi one plus phi two. So this is one over two, phi one plus phi two squared. But phi 1 and phi 2, at the center, they are equal. Hmm? So this is actually 4 times phi squared, phi 1 or phi 2 squared. While this one, if phi 1 and phi 2 are the same, is just twice phi 1 squared. Right? Here I'm assuming that I'm at the center, and therefore phi 1 and phi 2 are take the same value. Because by symmetry, right, the decays uh, takes the same value here. So you see, just out of stupid mathematics, uh, we get an additional factor of two here, with respect to the original solution. So, building a linear combination of the two states and filling only that one doubles the, the sorry doubles the value of the density at the midpoint. By the way, notice that if I had taken phi minus, 
at this point, mm, because phi minus is phi plus minus, sorry, phi 1 minus phi 2, phi 1 and phi 2 take the same value here, phi minus is 0 here. This is exactly the node of phi minus. Okay, so the charge density of phi minus here would be 0. So in other words, by building this in a combination of phi 1 plus phi 2 and phi minus plus, plus phi 2, phi 1 minus phi 2, I've been able to shuffle the, the density at the center here and bring all the density here and zero the density in the uh, phi minus state. The total density if I sum phi plus and phi minus, of course, is the same because I've just been rearranging the same orbitals. But if I take one of them, the lowest one, then I gain a factor of two in the density. Okay? So the first conclusion is that uh, energy goes down by an amount which is proportional to this uh, overlaps. Second conclusion, the density at the center grows by, in this model, by a factor of two with respect to the um, original density, if assuming that the two atoms didn't see each other. So this is what, in this language, I mean in this model, corresponds to charge accumulation. There is indeed, with respect to the sum of the independent charges coming from the atoms, there is indeed a factor of two increase of the density at the center of the bond. That comes out uh, from, from this model. Questions? Yes. Okay, so in the case that the two electrons are sitting here, yes? Yeah, exactly, that they have no concentration of electrons. By the way, this is a physically realizable situation because uh, while we know that delta in naught must be negative, T could be in principle uh, positive, okay? So if T is positive, of course, the state that lies below is E minus. Uh, and if T is larger than delta I naught, I mean, this becomes very low in energy. So what I need to fill is E minus. Hmm? So it may be that at the center there is no charge density in the two cases. Hmm? However, no, wait a sec. This is not entirely true. It is true if the two orbitals are the same. This, this statement holds if the two orbitals are the same. Unfortunately, in cases where T is positive, uh, typically the two orbitals are not the same because they have to have opposite sign in order to make T negative, T positive. Okay? So I cannot do this, uh, I cannot play this argument again. In fact, I suspect that uh, I would probably find, regardless of the model, that there is still an increase in density at the center because they, they have opposite sign. So one would have to do the calculation, but I believe that uh, what I just said before is wrong, namely, you always have an accumulation of charge because uh, the fact that it's below means that the wave functions have an opposite sign and therefore when I sum them uh, with the opposite sign, I get uh, a positive interference of the two uh, wave functions. Yeah. Well, one would have to do the calculation, but I'm pretty sure that one would always get an accumulation of charge in the lowest state, regardless of the sign of T, because of the way the wave functions sum up. Yeah. Yes? Yes, correct. This discussion only holds, uh, at least uh, most of the discussion only holds for electrons uh, that uh, um, uh, belong to atoms of the same kind. Mm? We are not going to discuss uh, uh, what happens uh, for, uh, say, for example, molecules that are not composed of uh, same atoms. You might easily, I mean, generalize these statements, right? You have, uh, if the atoms are not the same, the two starting levels will be different. You will still consider a linear superposition of uh, that sort. Uh, the difference here would be that E0 and E0 here would be different. Mm -hmm. There would also be some differences in delta E0. So, there will be, so the matrix will not be exactly A, A, B, B, but it will be A1, A2, B, B. 
BB for sure because it has to be Hermitian. So it must be symmetric. But A1 might be different uh, from A2. And at that point, the two solutions are a bit more complicated. They're not just A plus or minus B, but they, they depend on the value of the difference between A1 and A2. And I mean, it's slightly different. The mathematics is slightly different, but uh, the main conclusions uh, would still hold, namely that uh, uh, coming together, by coming together, there will be a net gain of energy, which will be a more complex function of this uh, larger number of parameters because you have more, uh, more, more parameters, and that there is an accumulation of charge in the middle. So the qualitative uh, picture remains the same. It just gets a bit more complicated from, uh, from a mathematical point of view. Yep. Any more questions? All right.